Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of my Z80 computer series. Last time we took a look at the Z80 CPU running as you can see it here and we took a fairly detailed look at the fetch execute cycle where the CPU fetches an instruction from memory and executes it. But a major limitation of the system as we've got it here now is it can only execute a single instruction. Effectively these dip switches here are our memory. Um, whenever the CPU requests anything from memory it gets whatever is set on the, the dip switches. So it's going to get the same instruction every time. So we can't run a series of instructions together to make a short program. So that's going to be the goal of this video. Um, we're going to be swapping out these dip switches with a, a ROM chip and we'll program the ROM chip to run a small program. So the ROM chip I'm going to be using is this AT28C256. I think the 256 stands for 256 kilobits of memory and as we have 8 bits to the byte that works out to 32 kilobytes of memory. Now something I should point out, there's lots of different types of ROM chips that you can get and I did make a mistake myself and ordered the wrong one. The, the original one I ordered required 12 volts to erase the chip. Now some of the uh, earlier um, ROM chips or EEPROM chips um, used ultraviolet light. They have a little window in the top uh, where, where you have to expose them to ultraviolet light to erase them. So if you're picking up second-hand chips, you just need to be aware of that and just make sure that you get a chip that you can program. The next problem I ran into with these 28C256 chips is they actually have a feature called write protection, um, which originally I wasn't aware of, and I built up a programmer and I just couldn't get it to accept the program. I just couldn't write anything to the chip. And after a bit of uh, reading around, I discovered that they've got this write protection feature. And you can actually disable it by just sending a series of bytes to certain uh, memory locations in a certain sequence, and it should unlock the chip. And I tried to do that with a little Arduino sketch, and I, I just couldn't get it to work. It just wouldn't unlock, and I just couldn't write anything to the chip. Now I was using an EEPROM programmer uh, designed by Ben Eater. Now if you haven't seen Ben Eater's video series on building his CPU on breadboards, I highly recommend that. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating series where Ben designs his own CPU and builds the whole thing on breadboards and he goes through it step by step, explains absolutely everything in, in superb detail how each part of the CPU works and it's just a fascinating series so I highly recommend go and look at that um, but part of that series he used an EEPROM and he designed his own EEPROM programmer using an Arduino and I figured that you know that is an excellent project on its own to build an EEPROM programmer um, so my plan was to use his design but I just couldn't get it to work now I will iterate there is absolutely nothing wrong with his design it works perfectly for his application um, but for the AT28C256 chip that we've got here it's not really practical. Um, I did a little bit more digging around and eventually stumbled across this github page by Tom Nisbet. I believe that's how you pronounce that, Nisbet. Um, and this actually claims to have optimized code that supports the timing requirements needed to unlock the 28C series software protection algorithm. So it sounded perfect. I, and I've dug into this and this is the way I've gone and, and this does work. Um, and it did solve my problem. So thanks to Tom because he's shared all of his work here and yeah, it's, it's really helpful. The main difference between Tom's design and Benita's design is Benita is using the Arduino library and he's using the digital write functions, um, which are great. There's, they kind of provide an abstract layer on top of what's happening underneath, making it super easy to use. 
but it comes at the cost of speed. And as it turns out, this um, chip, this unlock process requires really precise timing. So we need something a little bit faster. And what um, Tom Nisbet has done is he's written his program to not use the Arduino library. He's actually accessing the ports on the 80 mega chip directly, um, which is faster. It's a little bit more tricky, but he's he's done all of that. He's figured all of that out. So we don't need to be too concerned with how it works. Um, just uh, it, it's faster and it, it solves our problem on unlocking this this chip. So he's got some uh, documentation pages here, which again are excellent. And what I'm particularly interested in to start off with is the hardware design um, and in particular the schematic. And what I did is I basically copied his schematic and redrew it in EasyEDA. So let's just quickly um, go over that in a little bit of detail. We've got the Arduino Nano here and he's using eight of the digital pins for the data bus. So this thick line here is the data bus. Whenever you see a thick line on these schematics, it's um, representing a bus, which is essentially just a bunch of cables. Now they're not all connected together or a bunch of connections, probably should say. Um, they're not all connected together. You can see we've got eight lines running into the bus. Um, it's just a, a, a slightly neater way of um, not needing to draw eight separate lines all the way around the diagram. Um, but just just bear in mind that's a bus and they're all they're all separate. Um, you can see them coming out again at this end, and then they'll go into the data pins on the 8028C. Then we've actually got um, a few control lines coming out here. These three lines coming here, and now these are going into some shift registers. So the way these shift registers work is um, we can shift data onto them um, bit by bit over uh, a single line. Um, and then it will appear on the, once all the bits are in the uh, shift register, it will appear on the output as parallel. So you essentially get serial to parallel conversion. And what that means is the big advantage it gives us is means we can control all 16 of these address lines Actually, I think there's 15 because there's a there's a one there not connected. Um, we can control all 15 of these address lines using um, essentially three uh, connections on our Arduino. So instead of needing um, 16 connections, we can do the whole thing with three. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go over the, the whole concept of how that works. But if you do look at the Ben Eater video, he does explain the concept very well of using shift registers to save on how many pins we need. Um, but yeah, there's our address lines from the shift registers going into the 8028C. And then the only other thing is another three control lines here, the three that are going around here and up into the chip here. We've got chip select, output enable and write enable. Um, so the Arduino will just be controlling those um, to control the 8028C. And they've got pull up resistors on them. Um, and then there's just this one LED here. Now, I was a little confused by this. Um, I don't really think it's required and I don't really know why it's there. Um, the reason it confused me is it's connected to pin 13 or, or D13 on the, the Arduino. It's actually pin 16, but it's um, the numbering inside the Arduino is, is 13. Um, and that already has an LED on board on the Arduino. The onboard LED is always connected to pin 13. Um, so I'm not sure why we need to connect another LED to pin 13. And what's even more confusing is that the way it's connected, it's going from plus 5 volts and it's going into this pin. So current is going to be flowing into it. So current will only flow when D13 is low. And that's the opposite to how the onboard LED works. The onboard LED operates when D13 is high. So this is always just going to be the opposite to whatever the onboard LED is doing, which is bit confusing I don't know why it's there it, it, I didn't label it up when I built my board because I don't really know the purpose of it and quite frankly I think you could just leave it off um, the only other things we've got here are we've got five volts and ground to all the chips 
and then a few of the connections on the shift registers are, are pulled high up to five volts and then we've got some decoupling capacitors here uh, we've got three one for each chip so we'll connect those as close as possible to the plus five volt pin on each chip and then we've got one little reservoir capacitor here uh, 47 microfarads which will will position close to the the power supply and that is actually coming from the 5 volt out on the Arduino Nano here the 5 volt connection so it's actually going to be powered from USB and then the the 5 volt out from the Arduino will power all the the chips so I took that schematic and then I turned that into a PCB design which you can see here. I positioned the Arduino Nano over on the left and the 28C256 on the right. And I deliberately left quite a lot of space around the, the ROM chip because I'm intending to use a zero insertion force socket on that, which will take up a little bit of space. We'll see that in a second. Um, then we've got the shift registers here in the middle um, this is maybe not the best layout. Um, my original thinking was, yeah, we've got some connections going from the Arduino to the shift registers and then some connections from the shift registers to the to the chip. But that isn't really the full story because there are quite a few connections going from the Nano directly to the chip. And I just wonder if it would have been better to lay the whole thing out kind of in a line. But, you know, this is what I've done. It, it works. Um... There's the, the top layer. Um, and the way I do my routing when I'm doing this through throttle stuff, um, and particularly with when I've got lots of ICs and I've got lots of connections, I try to route um, one side of the board. Um, all the routing goes sort of in one direction, so I've gone sort of vertical on the top layer and then uh, horizontal on the the bottom layer all the connectors is generally running across the board um, and the way I sort of route around the board is to use uh, vias so if we looked at one connection it's a it's a little hard to see because um, you, the, you've got connections going on both the top and the bottom layer but um, essentially this this connection I've got highlighted is running across here on the bottom layer coming up via a via and then going down here on the top layer and then into another via back onto the bottom layer and then across to this connection now you know it's a bit of a compromise there's a lot of vias there's a lot of connections um but uh it might be a problem on sort of high speed stuff but the, you know we're not really going to have any issues with this and it just makes the routing a lot easier there is another reason why i do my routing like this um, is because of the um, the ground plane, the solid red area that we're seeing here um, is a ground plane. Um, it's kind of like a, um, a like a flood fill. It floods the whole board with with copper um, and it acts as a ground. And I find that if you've got um, your your traces, your routing running both horizontal and vertical on the same layer then it, it doesn't fill in this ground plane as well. It can't sort of flow through the whole board. It it gets blocked by um, certain sort of tracks running in, in its way. So if they're generally running all in the same direction, you don't have that problem and it and it floods the board nicely when you do your, your copper ground plane. Um, I did not quite successful on the, the bottom layer. You can see sort of the black areas here is, is where that didn't um, fill in with ground because it just couldn't get through anywhere. Um, but for the most part, the, that, that works quite nicely. Um, and I think that's that's good enough for this design. We can have a quick look at a 2D view of the board. So that's kind of what the board's gonna look like when we get it manufactured. And we should also be able to see a look at a 3D view. Now I haven't got 3D models for all the components, but yeah, not much of a, a 3D view, but you you get a little bit of an idea. So there's gonna be an Arduino here and 
few chips in these spaces. I probably could have modeled the chips, but I'm going to use a zero insertion force socket there and I couldn't have modeled that. And I have no idea of how we would model the, the Arduino. So I sent the design over to JLC PCB and they've manufactured them and shipped them to me. Um, I was quite impressed with how quickly they did that. I'm not sure if they state 15 days or three weeks um, delivery time on, on the shipment method that I chose, but they actually manufactured the board in about three working days and then they shipped it in about seven days. So 10 days total and I, I had the boards back. So here they are. They look uh, really nice as usual, really high quality for considering the low cost that we pay for them. Um, I actually had five made up. I've, I've built one up myself. Got this one here that I've actually assembled. We'll have a closer look at that in a sec, um, which leaves me with uh, four spare. Now I like to always keep a spare for myself, uh, just in case I have a problem and I need to build another one. But that leaves me with three, which if you're in the UK, I am prepared to give these away and I will ship them to you. Um, I mean, they're, they're just, you can just put them in an envelope and send them for the cost of a stamp. So it doesn't really cost me much. Um, so I would be prepared to give the, the remaining three away, but it would have to be like first come, first serve. And I only really want to do that you know, in the UK, otherwise shipping costs just get silly. Um, so if you want one, uh, just leave us a comment and you'll need to send me a private message. Um, YouTube doesn't seem to have a private messaging system. I'm not sure why, um, but usually people can find me on Facebook. So if you can find me on Facebook and you send me a private message and you want one of these programmer boards, I will ship you one. But it is just the PCB. You will need to source all the components yourself. Let's have a quick look in detail at the one I built up. So you will need an Arduino Nano. Now I will say that, again, be really careful what you're buying because there's all sorts of Arduino Nanos. You can get them in five volts and 3.3 volt versions. Um, and there's also a 168 version and a, 30, and a, and a 328 version. Um, the 168 version only has 16K of RAM and that isn't enough for this application. You need the, the 328. I did... Um, have a go at trying to squeeze the the program onto the 168 and i did send tom a message and he was kind enough to reply to me and said it's possible we could do it but it, it would take a bit of work and i just really couldn't be bothered um it's just as easy to order a, a 328 so that's what i've done um now i used the shift registers here that tom recommends which are the 74 ls 164 um, two of those. Um, they will work with the 74595s, but you need to make some modifications. And Tom does explain that, but I was a little confused by exactly how that works. And I figured um, let's just go with the ones that, that Tom's using. Um, save anything from going wrong. Uh, yeah, there's the uh, pull up resistors, and one of the resistors here is the current limiting resistor for the LED, which I did include. Um, there's the little reservoir capacitor um, and then we've got this zero insertion force socket which again I highly recommend you could just use a regular socket um, but they're not really designed to be continuously sort of inserted and removed they, they start to wear and become a bit loose whereas the way these things work is you just drop your chip in here um, you need to be careful to get it around the right way you just drop the pin in there, the chip in there like that. There's no um, no force. You just just literally drop it in, and then you just pull the lever down, and it clamps onto the legs of the chip. Um, and then when you want to release it, you just lift the lever, and you can pull the chip out again, again with no force. So uh, highly recommend using one of these because we're going to be programming this chip a few times. It's going to be in and out like a yo-yo. So this is definitely worth. Uh, using. Um, I probably should get another one so that we can build that into the design. So now I've got the thing built up, let's have a quick look at how we use it. So the first thing you want to do is head over to Tom's GitHub page 
and download the Arduino sketch. And I think what I did, you can go to code here and you can just download the zip. I then downloaded the zip, unzipped it, and then you can open it up in the Arduino IDE and you can send it to the to the Arduino. So that should be fairly straightforward um, if you've used Arduinos before. There's nothing difficult there. And then you will need a terminal emulator. Um, I'm on a Mac, so I'm using this one called Serial Tools, but I believe Tom's page does sh um, recommend something for Windows. Um, but I'm using this one. So there are a few settings that we need to use. Uh, we need to select this correct serial port. So this is this is the correct one for me. Um, the board rate um, needs to be set to 115200. Uh, 8 bits, no parity and one stop bit. And then we should be able to say connect. And we get a little prompt. And if we just press the enter key, um, this is a, a good sign. It shows we've successfully connected. So the, the Arduino must be at least running the sketch. Um, it gives us here the commands that we can use. Um, there's quite a few commands here, but I'm only gonna look at a couple. Um, we can probably go into this a bit deeper in the future. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is dump to dump bytes from the device, so that's a D. So if we press D, um, I believe the S is here, we can give it an address. Um, not sure why he's used the letter S to represent an address, but um, if we don't specify anything, if we just say D, it will go to address zero, and it will dump out the contents of the ROM chip. And we can see the ROM chip is actually full of um, binary ones um, ff is eight ones in binary so everything is set to um, a one and if you just press enter it will go to the next i think it's showing us um they're in blocks of four one two three four so is that 16 bytes it's showing us there um and if we press enter we'll get the next 16 bytes i think this is all hexadecimal so one zero in hexadecimal is 16. Um, so that's the next 16. And then uh, two zero would be 32. So you can see the, the whole thing is just essentially blank. Um, it's just filled with ones. So we'll want to put our program here at um, address zero because that's where the Z80 will go to when it first boots up. Um, so we'll have to take a look at our program. But the other thing is here, we've got the U command to unlock. Um, I've actually already done it, but we should be able to just do that again. If we press escape, we get out of this. And then if we press U to unlock, writing the unlock code to disable software write protection mode. So it, it seems to be successful and, and I can verify it does work because I've gone through this once already. Um, so we are now ready to start uh, writing our program. So this is the program we're going to be executing. Uh, the middle part here is what we call the mnemonics. Um, it's a slightly more human readable form of the assembly language. And I've just manually um, compiled those down into these hexadecimal numbers here, hoping that I've got it all correct because um, I'm not actually using an assembler here, it's just simple text editor. Um, so I, I've just manually worked out what the numbers need to be. And then we've just got some comments over here on the right. Um, you can ignore this uh, org instruction here. Um, it isn't actually an, an instruction, it's just a, a directive to the assembler to tell the assembler where the program should sit. But as we're not using an assembler, that is irrelevant because I'll be manually putting the program in the right place. Um, so let's just go over this line by line. The first line here is load B comma 10. I'm just loading the number 10 into register B. And that compiles down to 06. So the 06 is actually the load B um, instruction. It's normally written as load B comma N, saying that we're loading a number into register B. 
and then the next byte that follows it is the number that we're actually going to load. So that's how that compiles down, 060A. OA is the number 10 in hexadecimal. Um, and then we've got the same here, load C comma zero. Um, so the zero E is the load C comma N instruction. And then the next byte is the zero that we're gonna load into it. Um, now next we've got this loop, you can kind of ignore that. Um, if we were using an assembler, it would work out what number needs to go into this position. It'd work that out for us. Um, but as I'm doing it by hand, I'm gonna have to work it out myself. And that's this number here. Um, we'll come to that in a second. Let's look at this instruction, out C comma B. Now, when you get these brackets, um, it means we're talking about what's inside the register C. Um, and in our case, it's a zero. Now, I did put this instruction in here, load C comma zero, but it, for our current situation, it's irrelevant because we don't have any real IO addressing on the system at the moment. So it doesn't matter what address we used. Um, we could have used the number zero, anywhere between zero and 255, um, but it is irrelevant. It wouldn't matter because we don't actually have any addressing set up for the IO yet. Um, so um, regardless of what address we're writing to, the, it, it will be output onto the data bus anyway. So that's all we're gonna be looking at. Now out C comma B, so we're actually putting the contents of register B um, into the IO device that's at the, the address held in um, register C. Um, don't worry too much about it, we'll get into it more later. Um, but all we're really interested in knowing at this point is we're outputting the register B onto the data bus. Uh, the next instruction is this DJNZ loop. Now, DJNZ is the uh, mnemonic and that compiles down to the number 10, or 10 in hexadecimal, one zero. And then the loop, like I said, that is um, where we're gonna be jumping to. Let's just explain DJNZ. So DJNZ is decrement B and jump relative if not zero. So it's gonna take the, the B, which is gonna be 10, and it's gonna decrement it down to nine. Um, and that's not zero, nine is not zero. So it will do the jump. Um, but eventually we will, um, B will continuously be decremented down because we'll be going around this loop and eventually B will, will become zero. And then when it, when it is zero, uh, it won't do the jump and it will just execute the next instruction, which is a halt, which is seven, six in hexadecimal, which just tells the CPU to stop, um, processing. Um, so this, the loop, I had to work that out and it was the bit that I was most concerned about getting it incorrect. Um, it, it needs to be a, a negative number because we're jumping backwards. And the way I just worked them out in my head because I just got to do the maths in my head. Um, if we didn't jump at all, um, that would be a zero, which would be uh, just telling it to not jump at all and execute the next instruction. So I kind of see that as being here if it was zero. Uh, if it was FF, it would be minus one. So it would jump to here. If it was... FE, it would jump to here. And if it was FD, it would jump to here. So FC should be the correct location to jump to, which is here, which is our loop. So I'm hoping that FC is the right number. I'm pretty sure it is. So the next thing to do is take these hexadecimal numbers here and punch them into our programmer and we can get them burnt into the chip ready to run. So let's do that next. So I'm in the terminal here where we can do the programming. Let's get the list of commands up and we're gonna be using this P command, which stands for poke, um, which is write values to device up to 32 values. You can see it takes um, an address and then um, just some data. So if I do P zero, 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 and then our data is 06, 0A, 0E, 00, ED, 
four one one zero FC seven six. Press enter, poke successful. And if we do D to dump, we can just check that. And there it is, there's our program programmed into the EEPROM. So that's awesome. That's showing that the EEPROM programmer is working and we're, we're ready to go now. So what I'll do next is I'll um, disconnect the power and I'll get the EEPROM put into the circuit and we'll try it out. Okay, so I have removed the dip switches from here and replaced them with the EEPROM chip, which is a kind of buried under all of these wires now. Bit bit of a mess, but um, we should be able to see what's going on. Uh, the green wires are the address lines, so they're just taken over from the Z80 chip over to the ROM. Um, they, they don't run in sequence, um, so you need to be, make sure that you've got all the connections going to the right places. Uh, the blue wires here are the data lines, again going over from the Z80 to the ROM chip. And then these yellow wires are also the data lines. I've just broken that out here to some LEDs. I've got a little resistor network in here to limit the current on the LEDs. So uh, I went a bit aggressive on that. I think they're, they're 1K resistors. Um, so these LEDs are a little bit dim, but that's fine. So a couple of other connections that are worth mentioning are these two orange wires here. Um, the one down here is the memory request line and that's going to the chip enable of the ROM chip so every time we want to access memory the ROM chip is activated and then we've got the read line here and that's connected to the output enable of the ROM so every time we're trying to read memory this ROM chip will be enabled. A um, couple of red wires over here one of them is the power connection the VCC connection to the ROM and the other one is the write enable. We don't want to be writing, so that's just pulled high to disable the writing. Um, and then I think finally there's a black wire buried in there somewhere. That's the that's the ground connection here. And the other black wire you can see here is um, just the ground from these LEDs going back to the ground there. So I've got the clock set to manual. Um, so if I reset it, I'll reset it with this pen, that's the reset button, and then I'll give it a few clocks. A few more just to be sure. So that should be fully reset now. And if we manually step through it, we can see the first thing that happens is we get um, these two lights lit here. Now this is binary, so this will be two and four, which is six, which is what we're expecting. We have a look at our program. We can see that uh, load B is the first instruction and that is uh, zero six. So that's what we're expecting. We continue stepping through. The next thing that's appeared on the data line is so that's one two four eight so it's eight and two so that's ten and again if we look at our program that is what we're expecting because we're loading ten into the b register and that's zero a in hex but that's ten in in decimal we continue stepping through next one we're expecting is zero e the easiest way to read these um, binary numbers is to split them into groups of four. And we can see the first group of four is all off, so that's zero. And then the next one we've got here, so that's eight and four is 12 and two more is 14. So yeah, that would be zero E because zero F would be uh, 15. Yeah, that's right, that's zero E. So we continue to step through. Now the next one will be tricky to see because it's a zero. So we'll just ignore that because it's it's probably here. And then what have we got next? Um, this again is three lights here. That's an E. We just saw that. Um, and then here we're looking for a D. So that is 
8 and 4 is 12, and then one more is 13. That's right, isn't it? It's one less than E. So let's continue. So the next one should be a 4, 1. And that is a 4, isn't it? If we took the first four bits here, that's a 4. And then this is obviously a 1. So that's 4, 1. So all looking good. Uh, the next instruction, well, actually, this instruction is the out C, comma B, so we should see it output to the data line now. Now, there is 8 and 2, so that's the 10, so it is outputting the 10 to the data bus. No lights over here yet, but I suspect one more clock. There we go, and now we've got the I.O. request lit. And I believe that's the right line that we've got over there saying that we're writing to the I.O. So this is our actual output that we were expecting, the number 10. So every time we see this I.O. line lit, that's the, the output that we're looking for. So I'm just going to step through this now, and we would expect the next time that this light is lit, we would expect the number 9 here. So I'll just step through... Now that is it, I believe, that is the number 9, there's 8 and 1, so we'll expect the very next clock cycle to light this light. So it's just worth mentioning here that what actually happens is when it executes the output instruction, the data is actually output to the data bus first, and then on the next clock cycle the I.O. line goes low, which is there, so that's gone low. So that um, when that happens, when that goes low, we're guaranteed that the data is sitting there ready on the on the data bus. So what have we got? Nine. So let's keep going. I'll try and go a bit quicker. Uh, that's eight. Next clock, that's there. That's seven in the output. So we should be expecting a six. There it is. And there's the output. Now we're looking for a five. There it is. And that's the output. that looks like a four yeah and there's three nearly there there's the two There's the one. Okay, so now we, so we're at one, so it's gonna to have to decrement one more time, which will be the next instruction. So the next instruction is 10 FA, so that is, uh, well it's 10 in hex, it's a one zero. And then we're looking for um, I said FA, that was wrong. It was there's the F, all of them lit, and then two more here. So that's eight and four is twelve, and then it should this time it's not gonna do the, the jump, so it should move to the halt instruction. Now that is probably the whole instruction. That is, yeah, that's seven and six. Yeah, so that is actually the whole instruction being read from the memory. 
and then when it executes it we should see there we are the whole line is lit so that's perfect the the program's working exactly as expected it's it's not very exciting at this stage but it, it's exciting for me because this is the first time we've actually got a program running on the z80 not just single instructions but an, an actual program running so that really is um, some good progress um, so i think where we'll go from here what i was planning next was to add some ram to the system because i thought that would be the next logical step but i wasn't really happy with uh, how the the data that we're seeing here on the output is sort of mixed in with everything that's going on on the data bus which includes all the reading of the instructions that's a bit confusing it'd be nice if this output was just the output so i think what we'll look at in the next video is we'll look at how we actually address output devices and we'll connect a, a proper output device to the data bus so that we can separate the the data that's being read from memory to the actual output data I think that will make things a little bit easier to see what's going on. So there we are. Um, thanks for watching. And if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. It really does help support the channel if you can do that. And I'll see you in the next one.